Praise the Lord. Yeah, you guys, be seated if you can. Oh, holy, holy. What a great word. What a great word for all of us. How God speaks to us in our praise and in our worship time and how the Lord leads us into these uh, the images of life and, and how our lives are moving and what's going on in our lives. Uh, just such a blessing, and, and God does that all the time, and I'm so thankful for a group that is sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, which is wonderful. Uh, I know, uh, of course, this may be a little bit too much inside baseball, but um, about pastors, but, you know, obviously when you speak to people and you speak to congregations, what happens before you speak, start speaking, is always vital. Uh, it just is. And I know a lot of times and all through many, many years, um, it's been tough. You know, you've kind of had to try to maybe even dig yourself out of a hole um, to kind of get the, the attention back again to where it needs to be. But n we've never had that, that trouble at all. You guys are just awesome, even if you are like the government. You, they can't get anything past you. <laughs> she, just does, she just does what she wants to is what, <laughs> what they say. Yeah, move on. All right, we're in a, we're in a series uh, about following Jesus. And I mean about truly following Jesus and how our life is affected if we truly follow Jesus and what is expected of us and what is needed in our life and, and what, how, how do we need to prepare and be ready for what the Lord would lead us into because I don't know about you, but I have found that many things in life um, are affected my, whether I enjoy them or whether I participate, it's all affected by what my expectations are. And a lot of times we get busted right in the middle of our expectations. And that's usually when things become disappointing and, and we wanna quit because we didn't expect what happened. Well, the Bible is filled, the New Testament especially, but the whole Bible is filled with an opportunity for us to see what to expect if we follow Jesus. Because Jesus dragged a little ragtag posse of 12 men. Uh, oh, these guys were intellectual giants. I mean, they were, they were farmers and businessmen and, and, uh, and fishermen mostly. Many of them were fishermen. And some of them came from uppity families. A few couple of them came from uppity families. But for the most part, they were just hard working blue collar guys. And, and um, like Matthew, who is also called Levi, and he was a tax collector. He was a, he was a shyster, you know. He cheated little old ladies and orphans out of money. That's what he did for a living. Uh, they didn't have good reputations whatsoever. And everyone hated them until Jesus looked at Matthew and said, follow me, and he did. And he wrote a gospel that we're gonna read from in just a few moments. But all of the stories that are there, I, I was talking, I think it was with Rick last week uh, at some point, and we were talking about the things that were written in the Bible. And last week, you know, we ended, we, the message came from John chapter 21. And the last verse of that chapter says, that everything that Jesus did while he was on the earth is not written in this volume. Because if all the things that Jesus did while he was here were written one by one, the entire world could not contain the volumes that could be written about Jesus. So everything that Jesus did is not written in this, in this word. And it's just interesting to me that God chose the things that were written and they must have a specific purpose. And it's just fantastic. I don't know, I get excited about it. If you wanna know what excites a preacher, there's one of the things I just love. It excites me to hunt and to, and to search for, God, why did you put this story here? What is the, I mean, what were you saying to us when you put this here? What can we discover? It's almost like searching for a treasure, you know? But the trouble is, truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed. And God reveals it when he wants to reveal it, is what it boils down to. But he's been 
doing some good stuff. I, I've enjoyed being with the Lord these last years tremendously. And you would think after 47 years of studying it and preaching it and going to school about it and everything else, that you would be sick of it and that you would pretty much know everything about it. 47 years. Negatory. Um, that means no, by the way. <laughs> my, my little butt. I've got a little girl. Let me, let me take a break a second. I got a little girl on my bus. She's five years old. And she sounds about like a 23-year-old woman that, that brought, was brought up in, in, uh, uh, in, in the, the South and in uh, tough neighborhoods. Her voice is real low and husky and the way she pronounces words. I can just see her mama right now. She's, I guarantee you she sounds just like her mama. And I said that one day. They said, can we let down the windows or whatever it might be? And I said, negatory. And, and, she, and she said, what, what that mean, Mr. Keith? And I said, uh, it means no. And then, of course, they went on. A couple of days later, somebody asked me a question, and I said, negatory. And she said, that means no. <laughs> so it's so funny to hear these kids. I'm serious. They are hilarious. Uh, Art Linkletter said it right. Kids say the darndest things, and they are so funny, believe me. But anyway, God shows some stuff to tell us, and we've been looking. We looked the first week at the woman at the well and found out that we needed to expect to, um, for Jesus to just march us straight to things that we would rather avoid. <laughs> He has no qualms about putting us in uncomfortable situations. And then last, uh, second week, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000, which, by the way, is the only miracle that's listed in all four Gospels. And it taught us that we need to give Jesus what we have now. Give him our only was the, was the quote, I think, that, the, that came out of that, that, that stuck. Yeah, you know, it I, if you only have two fish, if you only have five loaves, if you only have three minutes, if you only have one day, if you only have one morning, if you only have $10, give Jesus your only and watch Jesus do miraculous things with your only. You just must give him what, not what you plan to have, not what you want to have, not what you're going to have one day, but what you have now. That's the, that's the key to that. Last week, we looked at Feed My Sheep, uh, John 21, and we found that although we're all following the same person, we're not all following the same path, and that God has different paths for us to take, and he calls each one of us to our particular path. And though we all follow him, he moves us with our abilities, talents, skills, the needs, the desires. You know, there's a whole world out here that needs to be reached. There's darkness everywhere. And so God has a way to meet that need, and it's you and I, and he gifts us, and he carries us in all kinds of ways, so we're not all following the same path. But Jesus called 12 disciples that went with him and followed him, and he just took them to everything. They, they ate with him. They slept with him. They ministered with him. They walked with him. They prayed with him. They, you know, everything he did, they were there just watching. Hey, guys, if you want to pray, come, come over here. Come watch this. If you want to pray for somebody, here's, here's how you do it now. Or if somebody's sick and needs to be healed, all right, come on, let, watch this. Let, come over here. Let me show you this. And... And that's how Jesus trained his guys. And, and they grew from 12 to later on 70 to later on 120 in the upper room to the next day 3,000, next day 5,000, grew to millions. And now we have around 2 billion people in this world right now that claim to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But it all started with these 12 guys that we're about to read about right now, and one of them is Matthew, that shyster tax collector, and here's what he has to say. In verse 22, chapter 14, verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, by the way, you may be interested to know that the Jewish 
in Jewish time, they had, at nighttime, they call the hours of nighttime watches. And they had the first watch, which was at 6 p.m., the second watch, which was at 9, the third watch was at 12, the fourth watch was at 3 a.m. in the morning. So here they are at 3 a.m. in the morning, in the middle of a storm. By the way, they called their daytime hours, they just called them uh, third hour was nine, sixth hour was 12, ninth hour was three, twelfth hour was six at night. So, so at, they're here at 3 a.m. in the morning, and Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. I almost said, it's Patrick Swayze. But I didn't think y'all would get that. And they cried out for fear. <laughs> There's a Greek word for that. It's kradzo, and it means to screech like a raven. Or, better translated for us, scream like a little girl. So these guys, I mean, it wasn't a just a little, ah, you know, like, oh, what is it's, ah, I mean, 12 guys, middle of the boat, 3 a.m. in the morning, it's a ghost. And they're screaming like little girls right out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I. By the way, that it is I is the same thing God said to Moses when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And God said, you tell them I am sent you. This is the same thing, except, of course, God was speaking Hebrew to Moses in the Old Testament. The, the Greek is ego I me. That's what Jesus said to him. He said, be of good cheer, ego I me, which means I am. In other words, Jesus said, hey, calm down, guys. The same God that was with Moses, that's me, and I'm here with you, so settle down. It's going to be all right. And then Peter answered him. You, gotta, you just got to love Peter. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Ho-hum. Mm -mm -mm. I mean, he walked on the water. I mean, that's just stated so matter-of-factly. He got out of the boat, he walked to Jesus. All right. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got to the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you, you are the Son of God. All right, let me give you five observations we get from that about really following Jesus. And I did say five. I know you're shocked that it's not three. It's always three, right? God works in threes. I've even said to you uh, that if, if it's not three, God's not in it. Um, but did y'all know I was joking about that, really? Right, okay. Well, there are five of them and you'll just have to determine which three are from God and which two I threw in there, all right? All right, let's look at them. All right, here we go, here we go. Observation number one. You might be following Jesus if you find yourself in a storm. Yes. Jesus is up on the mountain alone praying. Meanwhile, back at the boat, a wind from the west, by the way, that's what happened on the Sea of Galilee. On the Sea of Galilee at a certain time of year, when the sun went down, a westwardly wind started blowing across it, and it just, it usually caused a storm uh, at night. And this is exactly what happened. Now, get this, Jesus knew that when he put them in that boat. And let me tell you something else, they knew that because many of them were fishermen and made their living on the Sea of Galilee. And they had uh, tracked through these tricky waters many times. And so they knew it, and Jesus knew it, but, you know, these storms, <laughs> they just catch us by surprise, don't they, you know? Well, meanwhile, the storm is blowing up, and the wind is going, and the waves are going. And even these guys that have spent their life making a living as a fisherman on these same tricky waters are, are frightened to death that they are going to drown right there in the sea. 
Could it get any worse than that? Oh, of course. <laughs> Here comes a figure walking across the water, and they are saying, it's a ghost, and they start screeching like a bunch of little girls, and I'm having to wonder, are they more fearful of the waves, or are they more fearful of this figure that's walking toward them that they think is some kind of ghost? So here they are, and Jesus walks out there, and imagine now, if, uh, if, you're, or if you're these guys in a boat, imagine you know, you're trying to, de to deduce what happened, how you got in this situation, and somebody says, Whose idea was this anyway? And somebody said, uh, I think Jesus did it. Uh, Jesus is, well, is he here? No, but uh, I, do see, I do see a ghost <laughs> that's coming this way. Well, you know, you might be following Jesus if Jesus has put you in a storm. Now, here's what most of you that are watching you guys out there, and most of you that are sitting in here, came to church hoping today. That is that Jesus would get you out of your storm. Well, what if he's the one that puts you in it? Or, you know, the Bible says that, that times and chance happen to everyone. In Matthew 5 it says it rains on the just and the unjust. So we all get some of that. Or uh, the Bible says that God created this earth with seasons and maybe it's just that time of year and that season of life where you're in a storm that's just blown up because of the seasons that you're in. Ecclesiastes says there's a time for everything and a purpose for everything under the sun. There's a time to laugh and a time to cry, time to be born, time, time to die. I mean, it goes through all those lists of everything. So maybe it's just a season. And God created physical laws, right? And those physical laws govern the earth. And God set those physical laws in motion and those, motion, those laws do certain things. And they continually do it, and we're so glad they do it because we couldn't live on this earth if the physical laws just went on and off. Uh, gravity, as an example. We do depend on gravity, you know, right? <laughs> what if it just went away one day, you know? We just, oh, let's get out here. It looks like a good day for gravity today. Let's get out here and, you know, have fun on the beach. So maybe, maybe it's... It's not your fault, it's not God's fault, it's not somebody's fault. Maybe it's just, maybe, maybe it's just something that happened to you. Maybe it's just life. You know, bad things happen to good people sometimes. So, why follow Jesus then? Well, I can't tell you how many times I've asked myself that question. How about you, bud? You ever ask yourself that question? Why then, if I'm going to still have storms and I'm going to still have seasons and I'm going to still be in some hard situations, why am I following Jesus? I thought Jesus' job was to get me out of all my storms in life. And he's the very one that might be putting me in the storm. Well, I think if you're not asking yourself that question every now and then, you're really not following Jesus. <laughs> Oh, here, matter of fact, we can say it like this. Um, if you're following Jesus, you're probably ask your, asking yourself why you're following Jesus. Because sometimes life just doesn't make sense. And sometimes it rains on everybody, and we're in a storm, often because Jesus places us there. All right, we're not through. Ob observation number two. You might be following Jesus, if you can only see the next step in front of you. We shouldn't be surprised at this because David told us in the Old Testament, in the longest book in the Old Testament, Psalm 119. He told us in that Psalm that the Lord is a light, a lamp unto his feet and a light unto his path. And by that, he was describing what every Jew that heard him say that knew that you may not know, and that is 
that there were no such thing back then as halogen flashlights and LED bulbs and, 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 and things you could carry at night to shine your way. There were only lamps. And they had a little, what was called a foot lamp. And it was a tiny little bowl of oil with a wick. And they would strap it to their feet, to each foot, and, and light it. And it would be a little light, little flickering light. And as they walked, it lit up only enough for them to see the next step. And David said, that's the way God directs us. He doesn't give us the whole path. He just gives us the next step. And so you may be following Jesus if you can only see the next step in front of you. Let me show it to you in Matthew, verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, ego I me, it's me, don't be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. What? All right. I said it a moment ago, you got to love Peter. Uh, Peter always said things that got him in trouble. If you've, if, you've, if, you've read, if you've read the gospel, Peter says stuff all the time before anybody else can say things. He, he's just kind of the loud mouth of the group. And, he, and he, he just blusters things out. And when he blusters them out, then he has to live through them, you know? So he just says, hey, if it's you, Jesus, uh, hey, tell me, come. And Jesus said, well, get out of the boat. Come on, man. You know? And I'm sure that as Peter is trying to get over the side of the boat, he's talking to himself. You idiot. <laughs> you, what made you say that? If it's you, come on. You've got to open that big fat mouth of yours and get yourself. You know. Oh, me. Can you imagine stepping your foot on water and it, and it not going down? Have mercy. Peter's out there. Oh, how many of you, by the way, have tried to walk on water? Have you ever tried it? I know you have. I know you have. You've gotten out of swimming. You, you've gotten out of swimming pool before and you said, let me just see if I can walk on water. And I know some of you probably went running as fast as you could and thought you could skip across it. Well, I can tell you one thing if you've tried to walk on water. I can give you one truth about it. You have a 100% failure rate. You did not do it at all, guaranteed. Proverbs 16, it's, it's, a, it's one of the slides, Tan. Verse nine, I will show you this. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, this is important for you to know because I'm gonna tell you how God gets you where he wants you to and you not even know it, all right? How he does this to you all the time. Because see, you don't know what God's purpose for your life is. You can't know it. God says the heart is, is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. And who can know it? And that is absolutely true. We don't know a lot of things about ourselves because we are expert rationalizers and we never see ourselves the way we really are. So there you go. But God knows what he has for you. He knows where he wants you to be. He knows what's gonna happen when you get there. He knows it's gonna bless your life or you're gonna meet someone or it's gonna be a tremendous opportunity uh, for your life to go forward or your children or there's gonna be, there's some reason God wants you to be a certain place at a certain time, but you have your own plan. And your own plan is, I'm, I wanna go that way. Well, he wants you to go that way. By the way, let me just, Take a second to do this. Have you ever heard about the Blue Swin bicycle? If you've ever been in School of Leaders, you know what I'm about to say about the Blue Swin bicycle. I will tell you the Holy Spirit's job in your life. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He knows, he's God. He knows what your life holds. And he knows what's gonna happen in your life and he knows what God wants to happen in your life. You don't, but he does, and he's inside of you. You know what his job is? 
His job is to get you to want what God already has for you. Illustrated like this. Suppose you have a birthday coming up pretty soon and your parents say it's time for you to learn how to ride a bicycle. And you're about six years old, five years old, something like that. Say, so, yeah, we need to teach, we need to teach him how to ride a bicycle. Uh, we don't have a bicycle. He's never said a word about a bicycle. He doesn't even know about bicycles. And so, you know, he won't would really want one. He won't be excited about a bicycle for his birthday, man. He doesn't even know about it. And so you're going to yard sales, and as you go to a yard sale, you see a blue swim bicycle. And it is immaculate. It's beautiful. Looks like nobody ever even rode it. And they only want a few dollars for it. So you say, I'm getting him this blue swim bicycle for his birthday. And you get it and you take it home and you put it up in the attic where he can't see it. Now, between the time you buy it and the time of his birthday, it is your job as a parent to get your child to want a blue swim bicycle because that's what you already have for him. And so you begin talking about a blue swim bicycle. Son, look at this magazine kit. Look at that beautiful blue swim bicycle in there. Isn't that, in, man, that thing? And then you take him down to the bike shop and there's one that's got little, got little, uh, th uh, little uh, stringers coming out of the handlebars and, you, you say, and it's got a little horn. You know, get on there, son. Yeah, let's see how you look on that man. Ooh, look at that chrome. And that, that is beautiful. Don't you wish you had a blue swim bicycle? And before long, he cannot wait for his birthday. What do you want for your birthday, son? I want a blue swim bicycle. That's what I want. Well, all right. We just so happens we've got you a blue swim bicycle. And everybody's happy. You're blessed and he's happy because he got his blue swim bicycle. Because you convinced him he wanted one because that's what you had for him because you knew it was time for him to learn how to ride one. That's the way God does us. That's how God leads us, one step at a time. He prepares us and he draws us. And I say this respectfully. Now, believe me, I'm saying it respectfully that God does us a lot like we do our grandchildren and our children. You know, our children, they make all kind of stuff for us, right? They draw pictures and write things and they color stuff. And they bring them to us, and they're so excited about it. Look, Dad, look, Dad. Ooh. Oh, son, that is just so good. Yeah, that is. Hey, what's that little Hon King Kong-looking deal down there? That's you, Dad. That's you. Oh, yeah. That, I, I just didn't recognize. Let me get another angle. I just didn't recognize it. Yeah. All right, well, let's get it, and let's put it on the refrigerator. And you put all the stuff on the refrigerator because it's just so cute. I think God thinks our plans are cute. It, it, you probably hung it by that refrigerator magnet that says, if you want to see God laugh, show him your plan. That's probably where you hung the thing. So I think God thinks our plans are cute. And, and so he's not trying to destroy our creativity and he's not trying to shame us for taking a shot at something. And so when we bring him our plan and it's going that way and he knows that we need to really go that way, he looks at our plan and he begins to examine our plan and then we're all anxious about it. Oh God, I can't wait to start my new plan. I'm going down to the, there tomorrow and I'm gonna start right down there. And I, oh, I'm so excited about it. I'm just, don't you think that's amazing, God? That's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, good night, what a plan. That's just a great plan. Yeah, man, Proverbs, man makes his plans. God directs his steps. God says, you know, that is a wonderful plan. I have really never seen a better plan than that. It's so creative. I'm proud of you for being creative. But what you say, just for tomorrow now, just for tomorrow, that instead of going that way, what you, what you say if we go right over here? Let's just go right over here. And, and we'll get back to the plan, but let's just go right over here. So you say, well, okay. If I guess we could go that way today. The next day, all right, God, it's time to, whew, I can't wait, I can't. Uh, yes, that would be so nice, but the, I, th I think we need to spend at least one more day going this way, just right, just right over here. And we'll, we'll get back to plan, but we'll just go this way. And slowly, gradually, day after day after day after day, 
you started out way over there and now you're way over here. And God did it so casually, so gradually, so unseen that you really didn't even know it was happening to you. Because 15 years from now, he needs you to be standing right here, not way over there somewhere. God leads you one step at a time. I wish we could come into church and God tell us what's going to happen for the next 25 years in our life. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be so nice. As a matter of fact, close your eyes real tight and let's pray and ask him about it. God, would you show me the next 25 years? Uh, he didn't do it. Uh, but he shows you one day at a time. As a matter of fact, what does the passage say? I think I put it up here, Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross, what's the big word? Daily. Daily, and follow me. That's because we follow him every day. All right, observation number three. You might be following Jesus if at times you wrestle with doubt. Of course, I know none of you guys have any trouble with doubt, but some, some of us do. And many people think that if they have doubt that, that they don't have faith, that doubt and faith are incompatible, that you can't have both faith and doubt. Well, let's see what Matthew says uh, at verse 30. And when he saw that the wind was boisterous, that's a good description, isn't it? Kind of poetic word. The wind was boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Well, Jesus, it looks like you're confirming the fact that we can have both faith and doubt at the same time. As a matter of fact, it's even in the same sentence. Because here's the truth about God. He is not intimidated by your doubt. God can handle your doubt. Jesus never said to Peter, Peter, how could you do that? Why did you do that? You, are, you, don't, you, you have no faith, Peter. No, what did he say to Peter? He said, he said, Peter, oh, you of little faith. In other words, he's saying to Peter, he's saying, Peter, Peter, look, what's wrong here is that your faith is small and your fear is getting big. So what we need to do is we need to turn this thing around because you, I, you, know, what I, you know, Mitch, is what I picture on or, 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 um, or John, any, any of you guys coached before in your life? Uh, you know what happens when you got somebody struggling, right? Like a hitter or a pitcher or something. You walk out to the mound. Coach walks out to the mound. And he, and he, gets, a, he gets the ball. And he probably pats the little fella. And says, he says, hey, uh, what, is there something wrong? What's going on here? Are you having trouble? Look, it's all right. You're doing great. Don't, just relax. Settle down. It's going to be all right. What, what's going on? Okay. Well, here's what we need to do. Look, just make sure you step straight right here, and it's going to go straight. And look right at the mitt. It's going to do Okay? All right. We're going, yeah, we can do it. Okay, it's going to be great. I think that's the way God does us. I think that's what Jesus was doing with Peter here. I think Peter, Jesus, he reached out and he grabbed him. He, he, he got him stable, and he just starts talking to Peter right in the middle of the storm. I mean, the storm, wind still blowing, waves still flashing, everything, boat rocking all over the place, all kind of, and Jesus is just standing there talking to Peter right in the middle of all of that stuff. <laughs> right? While it's all going on around him, I'm sure Peter's going, well, Jesus said, why did you doubt? And, and that is such an honest question, isn't it? Why did you doubt? But the Bible tells us why he doubted. He, he, he doubted because he began to look away. 
Yeah, he, he, he began to look at the stuff around him. So the question is, why do you look away? There's nothing to see. Just keep looking at Jesus. He's the only thing that matters in this whole situation. But I'll tell you what doubts are. Doubts are proof that you got out of the boat. Those other guys weren't doubting. You know why? Because they're sitting in their boat. The doubt that Peter had was because he was not playing it safe. Because he opened up and said, let it come to me. So doubts really can be, and I don't, you know, I, I'm accused of being Pollyanna a lot of times, but doubts can be a very subtle compliment, actually, from your subconscious that you are indeed putting yourself out there. If you play it safe, you probably won't ever have any doubts. But if you have some doubts, it means, man, we, I'm following Jesus. I, I don't know whether this is going to work or not. I believe in by faith it is, but whew, man, I hope he does knows where he's going. All right, so there you go. You may have some doubts if you're following Jesus. All right, let me give you a fourth observation. You might be following Jesus if you feel soaked. That's the only way I knew how to say this. If you're just wet as you can be. Now, this is, you know, this is metaphorically. You're going to have to be thinking that way, not physically. All right. You might be following Jesus if you feel soaked. One of the greatest misunderstandings of Christianity is that our goal is to stay dry. It's the goal of Christianity not to get wet, to stay dry. Are you dry? Yes, I'm dry. Oh, good. Well, praise the Lord, because you're not a mess. Praise the Lord, you haven't got all wet and nasty, and that your life is real dry and real good, and thank goodness, thank the Lord. In sports, do you know what we call that? We call that playing to tie. Playing not to lose. In Christianity, are we playing to stay dry? Is that what the goal of Christianity is? That we would stay dry? Okay, everybody, get in the boat. Get in the boat. Yep, get in the boat. We're going to go win the world. Yep, get right there in that boat. We're going to win the world, but you got to stay in the boat now. You mean we're going to win the world staying in the boat? We can't get out a little bit, and, and uh, just a little bit out of, the, out of the boat? No, if you get out of the boat, you might get wet, and it's dangerous out there, and some bad stuff might happen to you. So we're going to save the world. We're just going to do it sitting in this boat and staying dry. I mean, is that, is, 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 that the, is that the standard? Is that what our goal is as a Christian? I thought our goal was to uh, follow Jesus. <laughs> what if Jesus gets out of the boat? We still stay in the boat? Yeah. Do you know what you become proud of if that's the way you live life? You become proud of the fact that you're not wet. Proud of the fact that you're dry. And instead of living a life of faith, you're now living a life of fear that you're going to get wet someday if you step out of the boat. And, and let me just ask you this question. Whose faith is inspiring to you in this story? Is the faith of those 11 guys sitting dry in that boat the inspiring part of this story? Or is it the one wet guy out there <laughs> that Jesus is holding up like a dish rag? Oh, I will admit now he didn't accomplish his goal. I mean, he did get wet and he did start sinking and all that. But at least he got out there. At least he took a shot at it. You know, the rest of those guys, they're dry, but they're not very inspiring. And, and I love the way the scripture says this. It, it, it's a lot of times the verses just say things in such a subtle way. In, in, in verse 30, you know, when Peter's out there and it says, and beginning to sink, and beginning to sink, like he's just slow <laughs> and beginning to sink. He, he's just starting to sink. Which brings me to the last observation, and that is you might be following Jesus if you're beginning to sink. Uh, one of the things I love about Jesus is that he will let you sink a little. 
he will let you kind of get wet. He'll let, yeah, struggle's a good word. He'll let, you, he'll let you start sinking and he'll watch you a little bit and get you, and you'll think you're going down and just, and, but, and then he just gets you and lifts you up. He'll let you get down there, get, get, get soaked, get a little bit of sinking, but, but he won't let you stay there. That's right, he won't leave you. Now, if you don't belong to him, uh, good luck. Um, but if you do belong to him, let me tell you what he's done. You, your life right now might be as full of sin and wickedness as it can be. And you have professed Christ as your Savior for real. And somehow things have happened and things have been casually let go and all kind of stuff like that. And you're thinking like, Pastor Tanya said up here that God doesn't love you anymore, that you, he doesn't want you anymore, and that he, you, know, you used to be all right, but now you're not even going to go to heaven when you die because God wouldn't want somebody like me. I lie and steal, cheat, I sleep around, I whatever, all that, whatever, choose your sin. But the fact is, he does love you as much as ever. As much as he loved you when you were as clean as you could be standing at an altar with your teeth shining and looking pretty. You know why I know this? Because Romans says in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we got clean and deserved it, not when we were looking fine and nice and acting all right, but when we were as sorry as we could be, when we were laying down in the ditch, we were worthless and useless, we were wicked and evil. At that lowest point of our life, Jesus Christ climbed on that cross and died for a wicked person like that. And he loves you just that much right now. And he is not going to let you get away. Now, you may be laughing and walking down the road and you may be haughty and all of that right now, but I'll guarantee you the time is coming when he's going to come and get his man. Don't make me have to come up in there after you because <laughs> he'll tear the whole house down now. I mean, don't make any mistake. Mabel, are you in there? You better come on out of there. Don't make me have to come up in there and get you. He'll blow the whole party up. Man, better come on out. Anyway, I don't know why I even said all that, except to tell you that he will let you sink a little, but don't think you're going to drown because he's going to get you. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna do it. It's just, you know, let's let you get a little soaked here, you know. And he reaches out and he gets Peter uh, but Peter's soaked, you know, and, and he plucks him right up out of the water, and then Jesus starts this conversation with him. This, this is really a, a, an amazing thing. I love how this thing ends. He, Jesus pulls him up out of the water, and the storm's still going on, wind blowing, wave, all commotion all around him, everything, disciples in the boat, <laughs> laughing at Peter or something, you know, ah, I told you, you couldn't do it. And all that commotion's going on. And Jesus is standing there holding him up and, then, and he just starts talking to him right in his face. Peter, what happened? Why, why did your faith get small and your doubt get big? Now, he's talking to him right out there. And I'm sure Peter's probably, you know, he's holding him and Peter's probably looking around like, Really, Jesus? <laughs> you have to ask that question? Look, look around us, you know? I mean, everything's going crazy. Oh, yeah, could we talk about this back at the room, you know? So he's holding him, he's right there, and then he t starts taking him back to the boat, and look at what verse 32 says. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Uh, the storm stopped. Jesus just said, peace. And the wind went, Whoo. and he said, be still. And the waves went, Whoo. 
when they got back to the boat. It seemed, now, now thinking about your storm, doesn't it seem better to you if Jesus would stop the storm when Peter started to sink? So that if you want to talk to him, you don't have the waves going and the wind going and all the commotion still going. Wouldn't it be better if when Peter, when he pulled Peter up, if he had just stopped it right then? But he didn't. He talked to him in the storm. He walked with him in the storm and when he got back to the boat and they stepped into the boat, the storm ceased. Uh, what's the point of all that? Well, I think it's right here in the last verse, verse 33. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So Jesus and Peter get back to the boat and the storm just dramatically stops. And all of the disciples are looking around and they're saying, this is unbelievable. Do you see what just happened? And somebody, you know, maybe James, maybe Andrew, you know, maybe it was Bartholomew, Nathaniel. One of them said, you truly are the Son of God, aren't you? See, I'm just thinking that by what is said here that there was quite a possibility that some of those guys in that boat weren't really convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. And when Jesus stepped back in that boat and that storm went, whew, all of a sudden they said, man, you are the Son of God. No one could do that. No, nobody could command the wind and the waves but the Son of God. And where did all that happen? In the storm. In the storm. The place you get to see Jesus the greatest, the place that convinces you of his power in the greatest way is in the storms of your life. Because if you've never seen Jesus as who he really is, that'll do it for you when all of a sudden you see him walk out and say to those boisterous waves, peace, be still. Man, and then pull you up out of that water. Well, you'll see Jesus then. And that's the way God uses life. So expect these things. Expect these things. These are the kind of things that happen to people that follow Jesus. Oh, I thought I was going to be, I thought I could get saved and my life would be totally safe. Uh -uh. Negatory. Ain't happening. No life like that. Jesus just takes you all away. All right, let's bow our heads.